Hello, and welcome to our webinar. Recently, at the Temenos Community Forum online, we featured a story that received a lot of great feedback. So in this webinar, we're going to re-feature that story and add some Q&A at the end for more insight. My name is Josh Verrill, and I will be moderating today's webinar, We Lab Reap's Advantages with Multi-Cloud Capabilities. I'm joined here by Arif Kassam, our CTO at New ODB. In this webinar, Arif will take a closer look at a case study featuring WeLab out of Hong Kong and how they looked to Temenos and New ODB for multi-cloud capabilities to launch their new digital bank. At the end, we'll open it up for Q&A. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to review a few logistics. Our webinar will last about 45 minutes. The webinar will be recorded and the video and slides will be made available for replay. Attendees will be muted during the call. However, you may submit questions at any time during the presentation using the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Arif. Arif? Thanks, Josh. Before I begin, um, I definitely want to, on behalf of the entire NeoDB team, I want to express our sincerest gratitude and appreciation for all the frontline workers out there who are working very hard to keep us safe and healthy during these troubling times. The world has definitely changed in the last few months. For businesses, this crisis has been a forcing function to focus on the most important things for their business. Even before the COVID crisis, agility was a top of mind for a lot of CIOs. Shown here is a survey from McKinsey from 2019 for top reasons for pursuing IT modernization projects. It highlights that agility is the top reason for these types of projects. Agility is critical for companies to be able to adapt to changing situations. A year ago, maybe, maybe uh, you had to adapt to a new competitive threat or uh, needed to adapt to different uh, customer expectations or changing customer expectations based on how they interacted with their mobile banking application. But what this uh, pandemic has shown us is that agility is more important than ever to be able to protect uh, companies and enterprises from unexpected situations. Having a cloud and multi-cloud strategy is one way to prepare yourselves for uncertainties of tomorrow. We've been talking about cloud for a while, uh, but frankly, a lot of that buzz uh, are from internet companies or, or social media companies, companies who've been, who are born in, in the cloud, right? So those companies are already in the cloud. They're already reaping the advantages of being agile and being able to adapt uh, usage and, and resources as their demand grows or shrinks during these troubling times. Unfortunately, for a lot of mature enterprises, really only 20, maybe 25% of their workloads are in the cloud. And typically, those workloads that are in the cloud are, are either uh, new applications that they've de uh, developed specifically for the cloud or uh, an existing application that they've moved to the cloud, which was relatively simple, small, uh, didn't have a lot of dependencies uh, with other things running on premises. Unfortunately, the vast majority of, of, of workloads for enterprises is still on premises. And that could be because of um, the complexity of that application in terms of uh, how, how much code there is there, um, any dependencies or, or complexities it has with other uh, applications running on premises. Um, there could have specialized hardware requirements. Um, something that runs on a mainframe is hard to move. Or it, it could be just some, something that, uh, that has security uh, requirements uh, preventing people to move uh, to the cloud. In, in Whatever the reason is, there's still lots of, of uh, workloads and applications that are still running on premises. And it's gonna be that way for a while to come. We will be in this mode of so-called hybrid where companies have certain workloads or certain applications running in the cloud and others running on premises. And that's shown out by this, this uh, another survey by RightScale, in this case, 2019 State of Cloud Report by RightScale. It found that a lot of enterprises are already using multiple clouds. Really, in, 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 in the way that most customers or most enterprises use multiple clouds today is, is something that's grown orga organically. Um, so for example, uh, suppose there's a company with a business unit that has an application deployed in AWS. 
they deployed that application in AWS because AWS had a specific service or capability that they needed for that application. And there could be another business unit in that same uh, enterprise, the same company, that has deployed a different application, and this time in GCP. And they could have deployed uh, the application in GCP because they have uh, previous experience with GCP and it was, it was easier to deploy it in GCP for them. So these two business units, two separate business units in this enterprise are deploying into different clouds. And so the company on, on the whole has uh, quote unquote multi-cloud capabilities, but really uh, because they're sort of isolated and separate, the company doesn't, isn't really taking advantage of that fact. And re quite honestly, not having a strategic uh, enterprise-wide strategy for leveraging multi-cloud multi capabilities is a missed opportunity to improve a company's agility and to protect against future uncertainties, especially in the cloud, in the cloud world. So what, is, what does it mean to be multi-cloud? And this sort of four by, uh, two by two matrix sort of helps um, uh, people sort of grasp where they are in sort of a, a multi-cloud uh, capability perspective. But let's start in the bottom left, right? So a common way for, for enterprises to, uh, to move to the cloud is, is so-called lift and shift. That is effectively taking an, an application that's running on premises, taking the entire application and having it hosted in a cloud. You've basically taken that application, you've lifted it and moved it or shifted it to the cloud. Since all cloud providers provide standard CPU uh, memory and storage um, capabilities, you can use cloud as effectively a hosting service, right? You can, you can take your application and rather than hosting it on premises on your hardware, you're hosting it in the cloud on, on their hardware, right? And that's a lift and shift. So you've taken it, you've taken that application, make it work, work in say AWS. So you, you've locked yourself into a specific cloud. You, you, you're, making, you're making it work to a specific flavor of, of the cloud, which is AWS, but it's a generic application. You, you've basically just taken it wholesale and moved it um, and deployed it in the cloud. So that's sort of the bottom left-hand quadrant. If you're a little bit more um, adventurous and, and more mature, you could think of a multi-cloud lift and shift strategy. So that's the bottom right. So it's still a lift and shift. You're still taking that application uh, wholesale and moving it wholesale into a cloud, or in this case, multiple clouds. So you've taken the, the, the application and made it uh, available or can be deployed in say AWS and GCP. Again, because all cloud providers provide um, IaaS or infrastructure as a service capabilities, that's relatively simple to do. You just got to make sure you, you deploy the, the right um, uh, components in each of the clouds. So you now have uh, a lift and shift multi-cloud strategy. So it's again, it's a generic deployment of the application in multiple clouds. So that's great. You've protected yourself against sort of uh, outages in one cloud or the ability to, to go to different clouds, but it's still generalized. What really you need to do is think about a cloud native approach. Right, and so again, the, the, the top left quadrant is a cloud native approach, but single cloud. What it means to be cloud native is to, is to take that existing application or build a brand new application that leverages the various services that exist in those clouds. Those could be Lambda services, they could be data services, they could be encryption services, they could be security services. There's all sorts of services that, that cloud providers provide. And you can take those services and, and leverage them for the application rather than building all these components yourself as part of the application. And so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're reducing the, the scope of the, the application by leveraging and, and, and integrating with existing cloud uh, native solutions. You could do that, again, you can, you can take an existing application or build a, a, a new application and you could build it for a particular cloud. So that's sort of the, the cloud native single cloud. Again, you can sort of hard code it to, to use AWS's Lambda services, for example, right? So it's a cloud native application uh, built for a single cloud. However, for multi-cloud capabilities, what you really wanna do is have a strategy to get you to a, a cloud native multi-cloud approach. And that's again, uh, the top right quadrant, right? You've taken an application or you've built a new application that leverages 
cloud services, so it's cloud native. But what you want to make sure you do is you design the, that application and the deployment of that application across different clouds that leverage this, the same type of service, but from different cloud providers, right? So what you've done is you've uh, allowed yourself to have an application that is cloud native, so that's perfect. So it's leveraging uh, the services from the cloud, but it's also cloud agnostic, making it cloud native that allows you to deploy that, that cloud native solution in any cloud of your choice. That's, that's the, the strategy you need to have a cloud uh, a multi-cloud uh, approach for deploying applications. So why would somebody go to all that work in, in, in sort of um, making a cloud native and a cloud agnostic solution? It, it's definitely more work than just a single cloud native uh, solution because you need to make sure that you work in different clouds and you, you abstract out the various services so, so that you can use different services from the different cloud providers. Why go through all that trouble? The, the benefit for a multi-cloud uh, strategy, uh, the first and foremost is increased agility, right? Having a cloud native and cloud agnostic solution allows you to respond to changes in the cloud ecosystem faster, right? Uh, e even though um, cloud's supposed to provide better availability, cloud providers always have um, and have had outages. Sometimes those outages are brief. Sometimes those outages take a long time and can be down for uh, a while. If you have a cloud native single cloud application, if your cloud provider has an outage, your service is unavailable to your customers. Right? Your, your, your customers will not be able to get to either to their, their banking systems or their bank uh, accounts or make transfers or make payments because there is an outage um, that you can't control that, is, that results in the outage of your service to your customers. If you had a multi-cloud strategy, you could either deploy, redeploy that application in an, another cloud and, and continue to service to your customers, or have the, the applications uh, go across both clouds. And if one cloud has an outage, the customers still see don't see that outage. They still have access to their, their bank account or payments capabilities. That leads us to the next uh, advantage, which is again, the highest, highest available, uh, available solution, right? Just like what you do for on-premises applications, you always have a, a DR capability. You always have to make sure that in case one site fails, you, you can start up the systems in a different site. You can always recover. If you're in the cloud, you, you have to have a quote-unquote DR strategy for your cloud, right? You could do that across uh, regions or availability zones in a single cloud, but you also need to have that for the, the different cloud providers. You need to make sure that if there's an outage in a particular cloud, whether that's in a, in a region or availability zone, you have the ability to move to a different cloud provider to maintain uh, service to your customers. So a multi-cloud capability provides the highest availability service to your customers. You could also consider changing regulations. Um, a lot of financial institutes are still struggling with regular, regular regulations. Um, the regulations are changing still. Um, God forbid, say for example, uh, uh, one of the cloud providers does uh, makes a change in policy to their to how they store their data. Suppose they can only store the data for a year. That may not be sufficient for a, a lot of regulators, and the regulators say, "Well, you can't have your application in uh, cloud provider X." Well, if you were again, if you had a cloud native single cloud strategy, you would be forced to do a lot of work to change that application so they can get deployed in a different cloud because of changes in regulations. You can also think about multi-cloud protecting and, and sort of giving you an advantage in, from a regulatory perspective. Um, WeLab, we'll talk, to, we'll talk about WeLab in a bit, right? But WeLab is a, is a bank in, in Hong Kong that um, leveraged a multi-cloud strategy to address regulatory concerns of having data in only a single cloud, right? So in this case, multi-cloud is an enabler for deploying financial service uh, applications in the cloud because it, it, without a multi-cloud strategy, your data would have been locked in or, or, or kept in a single cloud, which could uh, regulars could have said no to. 
another um, advantage for multi-cloud strategies is the, is the improved flexibility. And this is sort of a, a more advanced use case of multi-cloud, but all the cloud providers are, are competing for your business. And they compete for your business um, in two ways. One is the set of services that they provide, and second is price, right? The, the cloud providers are, are continually reducing prices and changing prices to adapt to, to competitive pressures from the other cloud providers. One advanced usage of a multi-cloud strategy is to use a cloud arbitrage type of model, where with multi-cloud, you can deploy more resources in the cloud that has the lower price at that point in time. You can almost think of it as spot pricing, right? You can almost think about being able to shift workloads across different clouds um, hour by hour, day by day, depending on how prices are fluctuating for those services that you use. This is definitely an, uh, uh, an advanced use case, but it is a use case that will happen. Cloud providers will be getting to a point where they'll be changing prices to, to changing demand and um, um, needs uh, across the industry. And so you could take advantage of that fact by being able to uh, have the lowest TCO and deploy the workload where it is cheaper for you to, to use. You cannot do that if you're stuck or locked into a single cloud. So I talked a little bit about WeLab in, in the last uh, slide. WeLab is a new digital bank based in Hong Kong. By leveraging um, their partners, Temenos and, and UODB, they were able to deploy a new digital bank in Hong Kong in a matter of months and leveraging a multi-cloud strategy to allow and provide their customers with the best service available. Without, without the, the, a multi-cloud strategy, WeLab would have been forced to um, take uh, a multi, um, forced to do work, additional work, which would take them longer to deploy the application into production by focusing on, on two different cloud providers at the same time. By leveraging um, their partners like Temnos and UODB, which already provide a multi-cloud uh, products, they were able to get to market faster, provide the best service to their customers, and leverage the benefits of their service providers. In WeLab's case, they have deployed UODB, um, UODB and Temnos Transact uh, across AWS and Google and GCP in a single logical database. That allows them to have workload, transact workload running in GCP and AWS at the same time. They can deploy uh, workloads as they seem fit. They can scale up in either work in either environments. And in case there's ever an outage in one of those uh, environments, their, their users still have access to all their banking information through the other cloud provider. So as I said, uh, WeLab has leveraged Temenos. So um, to have a multi-cloud strategy starts with, uh, starts with their, their application, their, their core banking solution. Uh, Temenos provides a cloud agnostic and cloud native core banking solution, right? By leveraging Temenos, WeLab was able to, to use a functionality out of the box, um, and deploy in the clouds of their choice without a lot of work. So again, the benefit to, to WeLab was the, was the ability to deliver value to their customers um, in a very short period of time. Again, they were able to deploy and, and get into production um, within a matter of months rather than, than years is what's typical in deploying a new banking solution. Temno supports deployments in AWS, GCP, Azure, as well as other cloud providers. They also provide a cloud agnostic solution by leveraging the APIs specifically for each of those clouds. Right? So with a cloud agnostic and cloud native solution, Temenos has uh, the ability to, to, to enable their customers to deploy in any cloud that they want or on-premises or across multiple clouds. So they, they're able to exploit each of the cloud, uh, cloud's managed services. So they do that with the API gateway. They do it with uh, container orchestration, middleware, and, and microservices orchestration, such as Kubernetes. That enables them to, to lower TCO, 
up to up to 10x infrastructure costs. It also allows uh, the benefit to their customers to avoid vendor lock-in and to comply with regula regulatory uh, requirements, just like we lab did. So with NeuroDB, NeuroDB helps sets the foundation. Um, having a, a multi-cloud solution like Temenos is great, but it's a mute point if the database does not support a multi-cloud environment. Right? So for example, let's, let's take, if you had Temenos, which supports uh, a multi-cloud deployment, it's cloud agnostic and cloud native, um, but you were gonna deploy Temenos on top of Oracle. Well, unfortunately, Oracle does not support a multi-cloud strategy. And so the benefits that you were looking to, to, to use with Temenos um, aren't realized by, by deploying on an Oracle database because it is limited to a single cloud. Distributed databases are a new type of database in the industry. They, take, they provide uh, the best of both worlds. They allow you to have a, a, a standard SQL database like Oracle, which provides asset transactions, SQL support, and is enterprise ready with the capabilities of a NoSQL database, which is for deployments in the cloud, scale out, and availability. So distributed, data, distributed SQL databases provide the best of both worlds. They allow you to take advantages of cloud native capabilities without sacrificing what you need from a SQL transactional databases like asset transactions, SQL support, and consistency. NeoDB is a distributed database. NeoDB is a modern cloud native, cloud agnostic database for transactional workloads. Shown here is an architecture, uh, a traditional uh, database architecture on the left-hand side. Typical databases like Oracle SQL Server have a single process that they use for both query processing and storage management. The the, the novel idea that NeoDB has is that we've taken that single process and split it out into multiple processes. We have the ability to have multiple processes and multiple nodes all look like a single logical database from the application perspective. So those nodes allow you a, a number of things. They allow you to do scale out. So instead of uh, previously with, with SQL Server or Oracle, where in order to address performance, you had to add more resources. You could add more CPU, add more memory, or add more disk to the hardware. In a distributed database like NeoDB, you can add more processes to improve performance. So you can scale out and you can scale back in dynamically to address performance changes. Because the database is distributed, because you have multiple processes doing the work of a single database, the failure of any one process does not affect the availability of that service. So again, from an availability perspective, distributed databases like NeoDB provide very high availability. So the loss of a single node or a single process does not impact access of that database to your applications. Another advantage of distributed databases is that they support multi-cloud deployments. You can distribute these processes in different availability zones in the same cloud provider or across cloud providers and have a multi-cloud strategy. You could also de deploy uh, a database across on-premise, on-premises, as well as the cloud and have a hybrid deployment model. You can get all this without sacrificing asset transactions, um, SQL capabilities and strict consistency that you need for banking applications. You don't have to be in the cloud to use NeoDB, right? NeoDB supports deployments on on-premises, in VMs, in containers, in Kubernetes, in all sorts of different deployment models. And NeoDB allows you to get to a point where you can then go to the cloud a lot easier. So it, it, in previously, I talked about the sort of a lift and shift strategy where you took the entire application database and all and moved it to, to the cloud and, and used sort of the, the infrastructure that was there and you sort of do it, did a lift and shift. 
lift and shift strategies are, are very risky because effectively it's an all or nothing, right? So you've taken everything that's running on premises, you turn it off, and then you turn on uh, the cloud. So it's an on off switch, it's an all or nothing. It's, it's all on premises or it's all in the cloud. With NeoDB, you can sort of do the shifting without the lift. Because it's distributed, you could start with a database, a distributed database on premises. So in the, for example, in the image in the bottom left-hand um, quadrant there, you've got uh, Transact running on premises on top of NeoDB. You have the benefits of scale in and scale out, as we talked about before. You have the benefits for higher, higher availability because you've got a distributed database that you're, that you're using for Transact. But in your move to the cloud, there is no lift and shift. You could just deploy one or two database nodes in the cloud, right? You can do that without any outage to, to transact. So you can take your existing database and transact that's running, and you could deploy a couple nodes, whether that's the database nodes or transact nodes, in addition to the existing uh, transact system in the cloud. And with that, you now have a hybrid model. You have a single logical database that spans both on premises and in the cloud. And so now you've started your cloud, your cloud journey without an outage, without any impact to any of your customers. You could you can continue and stay there, right? You could have a, a split deployment of NeoDB and Transact on premises in the cloud, and that would be a, your hybrid model. And you could you could do that for burst use cases. For example, um, at close of business, monthly or, 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 or yearly, if you need more processing power, you can use the cloud for burst capabilities. You can deploy more transact systems, more database systems, uh, nodes in the cloud just for that end of month or end of year processing requirements. And then when you're done, you can shut them down. So normally you've got a small set of nodes that are running your transact in your database for normal processing, but then you use the cloud for burst. Instead of just uh, keeping a hybrid, you could also use it as a transition to all in the cloud, right? So over time, you can move more transact and, and database nodes into the cloud and such that you actually turn off your processing in the data center. Again, unknown to your customers. Your customers don't have an outage. Your customers don't lose access to transact and their banking systems or their, their payments capabilities. It's still available in this entire journey from on-premises to the cloud. So now you're all in the cloud and you can expand that with a multi-cloud strategy, again, without an outage, right? So with NeoDB and how we enable uh, distributed processing in multiple clouds and, and a single logical database across multiple locations, you can, you can start the journey by deploying NeoDB today uh, on the data center as a step towards your cloud journey. So in summary, um, hybrid and multi-cloud environments are gonna be common deployment models in the future. Just as you're sort of migrating workloads from on-premises to the cloud, just because you're gonna have um, deployments in multiple clouds, either through different business units, it's, it's imperative that you think about a higher level multi-cloud strategy so you can be a more agile in the cloud world by being able to deploy in any cloud that you want. To, do, to deploy banking solutions or any solution in a multi, with a multi-cloud strategy, you need to look for a cloud, you need to either build or look for cloud native and cloud agnostic architectures. So you can leverage existing partners like Temnos and UODB, which already provide cloud native uh, and cloud agnostic solutions, or you can build those as part of your, 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 your move to the cloud. But you don't have to wait until you're in the cloud or until you've got a strategy in place to do that. You can leverage NeoDB on-premises today to take advantage of the distributed database capabilities it has on-premises as a step to future-proof to your cloud deployment by deploying NeoDB today. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time um, um, and thank you for your um, 
your interest in your DB. Josh, do we have any questions? Yeah, we, we do, Arif. Um, and, and I appreciate you uh, walking us through that. You know, it's funny, every time I, I hear that we lab story, I'm reminded of sort of the, the, the power of these innovative solutions. And we talk about flexibility, we talk about agility. And I think they did a great job of highlighting, you know, just what it means to be flexible, to be agile, to be able to move fast with how quickly they were able to, to stand up that digital bank. And I look forward to watching their, um, their success in, in the months and, and years ahead. And, and we're certainly thrilled to be part of that success alongside Temina. So yeah, if, if you're up for some questions, we certainly have some here for you. Um, and why don't we, we stay with Temenos? Um, we, we talked about them a little bit here. Can you expand a little bit on the new ODB partnership with Temenos uh, and some of the work that we've been doing with them? Yeah, um, uh, certainly happy to. Um, I, I think, so we've been working with Temenos for a while now, um, and they saw um, and, and appreciated uh, how we aligned with their own cloud agnostic and cloud native strategy um, and having a database that that sort of amplified their strategy with 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 ours. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, um, uh, Temnos uh, took a minority uh, equity investment in in um, in UODB. Um, so they are um, part of um, our company. We are um, tightly integrated. So uh, both from an engineering perspective, so we keep track of roadmaps. We make sure that each each company, both Temnos and, and UODB, there's a clear communication on on, on roadmap and, and changes uh, to roadmaps uh, to ensure that um, the joint solution um, works perfectly um, and is seamless for customers. We also work together on benchmarking, right? So uh, we want to make sure we provide the most optimal optimal solution uh, to our customers um, to again to be able to address their scale requirements in terms of the number of accounts that they want to deploy on Temenos, as well as just to reduce the, the total uh, um, amount of uh, hardware needed to run um, the bank. So um, trying to get to the, the lowest uh, cost per transaction or, or, or TCO perspective. Um, and also uh, just from a deployment perspective, um, we are, all our, our field teams are integrated to make sure that um, from a customer perspective, the deployment of, of Temnos and UODB looks like a single uh, seamless operation um, so that uh, we make sure that uh, all the configurations are in place. Uh, we, we've got training and um, uh, run books and uh, deployment guides to, to make sure that the experience for the customer is, is, is seamless and, and easy. Yeah, and, and some who, who have even who have joined the webinar today probably saw it via some of the Temenos social channels. So that they've obviously been a great partner of ours, um, helping promote this webinar series as well. So um, I'll I'll echo uh, everything that you just mentioned there. Um, so I think then the next question here, or if you touched on it on it briefly in one of the slides, you actually you had a good image there, but uh, it, it makes sense to spend a little bit more time here. Um, so the question is, a lot of existing banks don't have plans to migrate to the cloud overnight. It's actually a really complicated process and doesn't make sense for every application. Does a distributed SQL database help with that transition? Yeah, um, as you mentioned, I did have a, 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 an image on it, but maybe it would be good to sort of drill into this more, right? Um, it, it, without a distributed database, um, your, your critical applications like Temnos and, and other applications, uh, you're going to be forced to do some sort of lift and shift strategy, right? You, you've got to, you, you, you can't be running both in parallel because you, you end up um, fragmenting the data, right? So what you, you, what you need to be able to do is um, have one running. You could be loading the, the data um, in, in the cloud uh, on another system at the same time. But uh, at, at some point in time, you've got to turn uh, the, the system on premises off, and you got to turn on the the system in um, uh, in the cloud. It, it's it's this it's this it's this lift and shift strategy, which is very uh, very risky and and error prone. Having a distributed database, because you can have a single logical database split across different locations, is immensely powerful 
and reduces the risk of that that movement right you can you can just iteratively or incrementally add bits and pieces in a different location so you can add more database nodes in a different location you can do that seamlessly without an outage you can do that without impacting your 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 customers and so behind the scenes without sort of a lot of effort you can start having a, a, a migration to the cloud um, at a very low risk profile right that's that's really these these new the new distributed databases whether you're talking about a NoSQL database like mongo which is distributed but doesn't have the, the strict consistency that you need for financial applications or new distributed uh, systems like NeoDB, which have that consistency and SQL capability, really enable the movement to the cloud uh, a lot easier. When you're on Oracle or SQL Server or any of the existing databases, it's 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 difficult and it's it's very risk um, risky. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I've always in my head sort of thought of it as you know sort of diminishing this fear of the unknown with the ability to to sort of step out into it um, and certainly use new ODB as, as one of those things to help enable that um, that step-by-step -step process uh, out into the cloud. So, okay, that, that, makes, that makes sense. I appreciate that. Uh, slightly different topic here that, that we'll tackle that I, I do believe you covered briefly, but we'll spend a little bit more time with it. How does new ODB help in lowering total cost of ownership? Yep, uh, happy to touch on that. So there's there's two parts um, to uh, lowering uh, the total cost of ownership um, again let's, let's go back to what I'll, probably a lot of people are familiar with just a standard database um, how you deploy a standard database right so when you've got an application and you're going to deploy a, a new database on that application for that application um, typically what you end up doing is, is something called pre-provisioning right so you, you you take um, the you take the current workload and you say okay I expect my uh, database workload to be X now, and then in two or three years, I'm going to expect it to be to maybe grow 10x, right? So you've got you've got high expectations for for this particular application and your the growth of of, of users. So in two years or three years, I expect to, you expect to have 10 times the the, the 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 traffic. So what you end up doing is taking sizing that database for that peak workload in the future. You, you do that because migrating databases, again, migrating Oracle to a, a new hardware or something like that is very painful. So you don't wanna do that all the time. So you sort of, you pre-provision the database for an expected uh, outcome um, in the future. So now for the first year where I've got one tenth of the workload, I'm paying, I've paid for a system that can handle 10X that time. So I've, 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 I'm losing, um, the, 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 the utilization of that of that server is 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 minimal, and so you you pay up front for that cost. With with a distributed database, you don't have that pre-provisioning requirement because you can dynamically add nodes, scale out or scale in. You could you can deploy a database fit for the traffic that you're seeing now. And as it grows over time, you can just incrementally add more capacity as you need it. And so there's no more pre-provisioning. You provision just in time, right? The, 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 the other benefit of that is if you've got a fluctuating uh, traffic model or, or workload model, sort of like during a close of business where uh, at the end of day, month, and year, you've got uh, sort of additional processing that you need to do. With a distributed database, you can add more nodes for that for that point in time and take it away once that's done. You can't do that with a traditional database, which is pre-provisioned, right? You got to need to account for the close of business processing in your 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 database sizing upfront. So that's the first reduction in uh, uh, of TCO. So and that's a massive uh, savings in terms of the actual savings for 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 customers. The second part is again because it's distributed database, we're, we're utilizing all the servers. It's it's so-called active active. There's no need to buy an HA or DR system. Again, in in traditional databases, you have one system, and then you buy 
the same system for an HA, just in case that first one fails. And then again, in case your data center fails, you have another set of systems in the DR. So you've bought the same system three to four times. So again, you're playing three or four X of your, your database server uh, requirements, but you're only using one, right? In a distributed database like NeoDB, all the servers are being utilized. They're all active. It's act, sort of active, active. So again, you, you get lower TCO because you're not buying uh, these uh, underutilized servers for, for insurance. Okay. Yeah. No. So okay. Makes sense. Two core components uh, on on sort of lowering TCO and the impact of new ODB on the database. Um, but if we could, how how might that or does it even play into you know the multi cloud factor into that TCO cost? Yep. Yeah. So if you if you think about that uh, that first factor, that scale out factor, right? If you've got um, uh, an environment that's deployed across multiple clouds. As you need to scale out, you can scale out in either cloud that you want or both clouds. And this comes sort of back to the the, the idea of, of arbitraging that I, that I talked about earlier. So this advanced use case. So um, again, for example, let's let's talk about the end of month processing, right? So you're coming up on the end of month. You know you're going to have to deploy more resources in one or both clouds if you've got it already deployed in multiple clouds. You can you can check ahead of time and say, okay, well, the the cost per CPU is twenty cents in, in, per hour or whatever it is in in AWS, and it's ten cents in, in GCP. So it makes more sense for you to deploy more resources in GCP for that close of business workload, right? And so from a TCO perspective, multi cloud allows you to pay, play each cloud provider off of each other from a pricing standpoint. There's always going to be differences in pricing models across clouds. They're never exact. They're never going to be identical. They're competing with each other. You can leverage that to your advantage by being a, by deploying the workload where it's most cost effective for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, that, that control, that control to be able to do that um, is is key. So if, if we stick there. Um, so pricing is obviously one, but what else should people consider when selecting different cloud providers? Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of factors. Um, I mean, you, you, it could be anything where from a corporate perspective, whether there's corporate policies or, or, or um, regulations that, that, that people have from a corporate perspective in selecting clouds. So they may be already selected for the, for the corporation, but if you're, if you're, looking at at selecting different clouds again the different clouds have different capabilities they're not all built the same uh, they have different services um, again from a from a new odb and terminals perspective um, all the clouds provide all the services we need so there, there's no there's no um, need to differentiate there uh, so we, we, we use the basic services and those basic services are available in all the clouds so that's 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 fine the other part is performance um, again uh, the, the type of hardware that each cloud pro cloud provider deploys, the interconnects, uh, the, the latencies, they're all different. So uh, one thing that we, we, we talk to customers about is sort of um, um, tuning or not tuning, but profiling the different uh, cloud providers and specifically even the different locations. Because again, uh, cloud providers roll out different types of hardware, different types of storage units. Um, they don't do it all at once. So they, they'll, they'll deploy uh, different types of hardware across different types of regions. So in your particular region, you may not have access to the premium disks that uh, other regions may have. And so what, what we recommend customers to do is look at the, um, the storage, the networking uh, capacities of the cloud providers that are of interest to them and the regions in that they're, they're interested in deploying in. Um, that and again, that could be geographically constrained if they want to stay within uh, Europe or when they still stay within China or they want to stay within wherever look, look, locale that they're looking for. Um, so it's critical for them to take a look at the performance um, capabilities of the cloud to ensure that they can address the the needs that they they have for their their workloads and their users. 
Okay, got it, got it, excellent. Uh, so I think we have time for one more here. Um, and, and I like this one because it certainly speaks to one of the core differentiators of new ODB. Uh, the question is, how does new ODB support a multi-cloud strategy when Oracle and SQL Server cannot? Yeah, I sort of touched on this uh, in my talk. Um, Oracle, SQL Server, the, the standard databases that people use, Postgres, MySQL, they're all, they're all built and architected on technology built 30, 40 years ago. Right? They, they, they were built in, uh, for architectures based on architectures that assumed a single server. Right? They, they, that's, just, that's just how they were built and that's what they were architected for. Fast forward 30 years, now you've got cloud environments, distributed environments. Those, those databases were never built for these types of environments. Yes, um, they all have replication type of technology to help replicate data to different, different databases. But these are all add-ons. These are all um, uh, after the fact um, bolt-ons to try to provide some level of distribution or, or replication. NeoDB, when we were when when Jim Starkey first built NeoDB, he started with a distributed system in mind. He built the fundamentals of a distributed system. A distributed system requires replication built into it, requires the ability to talk to different nodes at different times. It requires performance. Right? Once he had the foundation of a distributed system, then he layered in the SQL capabilities of, of transactions, asset compliance, and consistency on top of that. You cannot start with a, a single node SQL database and make it distributed. It's just, it's the architectural constraints are too fundamentally um, incorrect. You need to start with a distributed system and then layer the SQL capabilities on top of it. And so that's how, that's how NeoDB can do a, a lot of different things that the standard databases cannot. Again, uh, the, the ability to span different locations, uh, the scale out and scale in, the availability capabilities, it's just, it's, it's impossible for the existing databases to, to do something like that because they are hamstrung, they're, they're, they're limited by the architecture that they built 30, 40 years ago. Got it, makes sense, makes sense. I appreciate that. Um, we have had some other technical questions that have come in uh, and for those who have, who have submitted those, we will address those individually. We'll follow back up with more details after the webinar. So with that, Arif, I want to I want to thank you uh, for joining us. Great presentation once again. I want to thank the audience for attending our session. We hope you found today's webinar informative and useful. And please visit newodb.com for more information. So thank you again for attending, and this will conclude today's webinar.